Truth, Money, and Freedom podcast. Welcome back to Truth, Money, and Freedom. I am lucky to have my friend Ron Calzone back with me today. By the way, it's Monday, February 3rd, 2020. And I thought we would actually talk directly with Ron to find out the status of the Second Amendment Preservation Act in the state of Missouri. Hey there, Ron. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, Patrick. How are you? Doing good. Hey, uh, what's the latest on uh, the Second Amendment Preservation Act on both sides, the House and the Senate? Well, some exciting things are happening, uh, more exciting on the, on the Senate side than the House side. But, uh, you know, we had some delays with the hearing for the Senate version of the bill. It was supposed to have had a hearing uh, two weeks ago, two Thursdays ago, but we got snowed out the first Thursday, snowed and iced out. Uh, the second Thursday, the chairman of the committee had a pet bill that he wanted the whole time slot for. And, and so last Thursday, he held the hearing for that bill, exec on the bill, for those who know what that means. Uh, it went down. It did not get voted. Uh, but then he did agree that he would schedule the Second Amendment Preservation Act plus Senator Berlin's gun-free zone bill for hearings exclusively this coming Thursday. So the 6th is going to be uh, is going to be the gun rights day in the Senate Transportation Committee. So beginning beginning at 8:15 Thursday morning, the Second Amendment Preservation Act will have a public hearing where you can participate where if you choose to send uh, online witness forms, we will print and deliver those witness forms personally to the committee. Uh, we will be taking a stack of witness forms several inches tall. Right now we have over 700 and some odd witness forms. I'd like to see that maybe uh, go up to about 1,000 if we can get some people off the, their butts and, and filling out witness forms. Mm -hmm. But um, So that's what's exciting is happening. Uh, and I think there's a very good chance that uh, with, you know, if not this week, maybe next week it'll be voted out of committee and it'll be headed for the Senate floor. So this is, this is way, way ahead of the schedule we were on last year. You know, we started this whole process way late last year, late enough we did not expect it to go through. It was just, an, it was just to get uh, the bill rolling for this year. And now we're, we're kind of getting a jump start on the session. So this is all great. Okay, so you're saying that right now it's looking like uh, we have a uh, hearing to get it out of committee on Thursday, February 6th. And that would be very public, so the, the public can actually come and support the bill. Um, would they have to get up and speak in support of the bill, or can they just come in and just show support in numbers? I mean, how does this work? No, they, they do not have to speak. Uh, you know, there is an opportunity for those who want to speak to speak. Uh, of course, we don't want to take so much time that they don't have time to, to do anything else, like mm -hmm. perhaps exec on the bill. I can explain that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, but just being there is huge just being there is huge these senators need to know that people care about their gun rights and if you care you're willing to spend time traveling and take time off from work or what other what other endeavors you might have and let your uh, lawmakers know that this is an important important issue for you uh, of course the other thing that you can do whether or not you go in person is you can go on to our online witness form system and fill out a witness form where you get to say whether you're for or against the Second Amendment Preservation Act, and we'll turn them in either way. I mean, if you're watching this video and you're against it, and you go and you follow this link and you check the against box, uh, that makes me a little sad. But <laughs> we will represent you. We will put. We will put your. We will turn your witness form in too. And there's a few people that do that. Usually it's a mistake. They're not watching carefully and they check the wrong box. But we'll turn in, uh, we'll print hard copies, and we'll turn in your witness form if you can't be there. Okay, so uh, how about on the House side? Where are we at on, uh, uh, that would be HB 1637, uh, Second well, Amendment the, Protection Act. So uh, Representative Taylor's version of the Second Amendment Preservation Act uh, is going to have a little harder way to, to go at the start. Uh, we have to convince leadership, particularly the Speaker of the House, that there's enough interest in this bill for him to assign it to a committee early in the session. And then we have to convince uh, the chairman of the committee to spend time hearing the bill. 
And these guys are not as friendly to the Second Amendment as, uh, as some of our folks in the Senate are. And so the way we're trying to convince them that there's a lot of interest in this bill is to get a lot of other representatives besides Representative Jared Taylor to co-sponsor his bill. And the more that co-sponsor it, the harder it is for leadership to say, oh, this is a fringe issue, we're not, you know, there's not that much interest in it. Uh, and so right now we're up to, what is it, 45 or 6? I've lost track. 47. 47 co-sponsors. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, all, you only need 82 votes to pass it and send it on to the, to the Senate or send it on to the governor. You know, so we're, we're significantly past the halfway mark just in terms of uh, the votes we would need. So certainly if we can get, you know, 80, 82 or more co-sponsors, then there's just absolutely no excuse for the, the House leadership not to fast track this through the system. So right now that's the focus. So on the Senate side, the call to action is fill out a witness form. We'll show you how to do that in just a minute. And on the House side, the call to action is make sure, if you're a Missourian, make sure that your rep is a co-sponsor. Make sure that they have co-sponsored this bill. They can go online either from home or from their office and electronically say, hey, I like this bill well enough that I want to be a co-sponsor for it. And, and let's build that 47 uh, to 50, then 60, and then 70, and then 80. Mm -hmm. You bet. So calling representatives and emailing them, you think, uh, is probably the best way to achieve that? Call them, email them. If you see them at home in the district, in the mm -hmm. coffee shop, or Walmart, or wherever, if you still shop at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been in a Walmart for a long time. Um, then... then uh, Talk to them in person. You know, if you can get by the Capitol, go by their office. In fact, if you go to, this is something that people don't understand. If you go to the Capitol and you go by your representative's or senator's office and they're not there, you can go to the Senate floor and ask the doorman to get them for you. <laughs> and if, if they're in the middle of a debate or doing something that's, you know, that they're, they're needed for, you know, they, they won't come. But if they can, they'll come and they'll talk to you out in the gallery or in the hallway. You know, so don't be bashful. These guys work for you. You need to tell them what you expect out of them. Mm -hmm. And in and and any way, uh, in the more ways you tell them, the better. It's, you know, a personal visit's always the best. A phone call is the second best. And an email is, is uh, you know, almost as good as a phone call. So make them. And, and then follow up. Don't just call them up once and say, hey, I really want you to do this. Uh, if they say, well, you know, I'll think about it, then call them the next day and say, well, you've thought about it. How about it? Are you going to do it or not? Mm -hmm. Do you stand for the Second Amendment or, or, or not? That's kind of what the bottom line. Okay. So basically we could say the call to action, especially since we're making this on Monday, February 3rd, call to action, number one, if you can be at the uh, Rotunda in the Capitol, on the 6th of February at 8, is it 8.15 in the morning, please do come. The, uh, the body count matters. Uh, just, you don't have to speak if you don't want to. If you're not used to speaking in front of large, um, you know, large audiences, you don't have to get up and speak. Just be there to support it. That would be good, too. Secondly... I, I, actually, let me, before you go on, yeah. it's, it's not actually the rotunda. You know, the rotunda is... is the big round room in the yeah. center between mm -hmm. the House and Senate chambers, but uh, it, you're, we're going to send people to um, the, the Second Amendment Preservation Act resource page, which I have displayed here now, mm -hmm. and and that tells you where to go. Okay, so gotcha. If you, get, if you get confused, so under uh, the action items for Senate Bill 588, here you see the date is listed, Thursday, February 6th, and for some reason that change, like if there's a terrible snowstorm and they just decide to go home early or whatever, then this will be updated right here. But it also tells you where to go. And right here it says in the Senate lounge. Senate lounge. All right. And actually, I see a mistake here. This says second floor of the Capitol. It's actually the third floor. I'll change that when we get done this podcast. Okay, gotcha. So the Senate, the Senate lounge is actually on the third floor. Uh, and that, And so when you go in the building, when you go in the main entrance under what's called the carriage entrance, 
uh, and you you have to go through the, the the Nazi inspection station where they want to want to check your uh, check you for metallic objects and things like that. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you've got a concealed carry permit, you can you can take a firearm into the uh, Capitol. You've got to show your permit. But um, once you go through uh, security, then you're going to turn right. The right side of the building, coming in from that entrance, is the Senate side, and you'll be coming in on the first floor. You go up two more floors to the third floor, and on the very far right-hand end of the building is where the Senate lounge is. And so that's where you'll, uh, where this hearing is going to be at uh, su supposedly 8.15 uh, Thursday morning. Senators tend to come a little bit late, but it'll be roughly 8.15. Okay, understood. So, so that so this would, is the... Go ahead, I'm sorry. This, this, is, the, this is the page to go to, so... Okay. All right. And of course, every single one of the links uh, for Ron's, uh, you know, Second Amendment Preservation Act page, of course, Missouri First page, uh, his video even, and also the witness form are down below in the description section and they are on top. It's called Ron's Resources. So you guys will see that at the top of my description section. So, okay, so going there on the 6th is great. If you can do it, let's do it. In fact, I'm sure Ron's going to be there. Uh, mine's up in the air right now because of work. So I can't give an ironclad that I'm going to be there on Thursday, but I'm certainly going to try. So filling out co or the witness forms for the Senate, uh, if you can't be there, is extremely important, gang. If you cannot be there on Thursday, please do fill out these witness forms. I can't stress that strongly enough. And if you've already done it, it's time for you to uh, to actually talk to your family, talk to your friends, talk to your coworkers, make sure they know about this witness form and they can fill it out. And Absolutely. Then, you know, that's we need to spread the word. And and you know, even if you're planning on going, fill out this witness form, and then my system will automatically send you a confirmation email with a link that will let you download and then print a copy for yourself. Mm -hmm. So then you can you can take that hard copy. And you may want to present it to the committee yourself, but that will also be in the stack with hundreds of others that we print out and deliver to the committee. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gives you some redundancy. If you plan on going and something happens, you don't get to go, then at least you know that your witness form will be given to the committee. Yep. And that's an excellent system, and thank you for that. And then on the House side, it's basically, gang, it's the same thing. We need the co-sponsors in the House. We've got 47, uh, technically 48, because we have Jared Taylor himself, which we're not counting. But 48 uh, representatives are for this bill and have voiced that they are uh, in favor of this bill and will vote for it. We need more. Gang, uh, please do. And once again, down in the description section below, I'll have again the roster for the House, as well as a shortcut to the where the co-sponsors are. Cross-reference make phone calls call your representatives gang uh we're we're working this um, there's a lot of people working this but we need your help too every one of you can make a big difference you can be a part of history you know um so i, I can't stress strongly enough we need more co-sponsors in the house of representatives so please do you make know, your phone calls and emails go ahead ron you know patrick i love the use of your your term history us making history mm -hmm. uh at least three other states have emulated the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act now. So Oklahoma has the same language filed. Mm -hmm. South Carolina has the same language filed. Uh, West Virginia has the same language filed. And we're getting it started in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And what, what typically happens with this kind of thing is one state after another will adopt the language. And then once you have several of them doing it, then you see a cascading effect. Isn't that what we saw with, say, if you look at uh, one of the states that were doing uh, county, uh, Second Amendment uh, sanctuary counties and Second Amendment uh, sanctuary cities? You know, first there was the, the difficult task of getting the, you know, the very first one, right. you know, uh, county uh, executives or judges or whatever they happen to call them in that state getting them to adopt it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the second and third, they were still kind of tough. They were the first and second followers that the sociologists would call them. You know, but then once you get a few of them, then they cascade yep. and it snowballs. And that's what we want to do with the Second Amendment Preservation Act. We want one state after another to adopt it. 
And, and, uh, and so we're on the ground floor. Missouri is leading the way. And, and so it's like leveraging our effort here in Missouri. Yes, we are, because by, by virtue of what we're doing now, we're actually helping other states in the future by the actions we are actually committing ourselves to right now. I see it that way too, Ron. That's right. And, you know, the thing is, is that the more states that do it, the more secure all of us are. Mm -hmm. There's strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to normalize it. And, you know, if anyone, any of you who followed uh, concealed carry, you know, there, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago, it was very difficult to get a concealed carry permit anywhere. You know, concealed carry was just not that prevalent. And one state after another uh, adopted concealed carry. They found out that sky wasn't going to fall. There wasn't going to be blood running in the streets. And, you know, so other states adopted them. And now, you know, is, is it hardly, a, what, two, three states maybe that aren't very concealed carry friendly? Mm -hmm. and, and then the same thing has happened with open carry and constitutional carry. You know, so it snowballs. And the, this idea of using the anti-commandeering doctrine to thwart federal gun control is starting here in Missouri. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it, kind of in line with that, Ron, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, both on Eric Burleson's Facebook page, in which many of these videos get posted, as well as on my own YouTube uh, page, people do say this is a feel-good bill, that it, it, re it really doesn't mean anything, because look what happened in Kansas when they went after the guy who was making suppressors, which was legalized by their version of this bill. Can you explain to the audience what happened in Kansas and what the differences are between the Kansas bill that was passed into law and the Missouri bill that we're currently trying to get into law? Well, I, I certainly can, but I would start out with suggesting that people go to uh, the resource page, which you're going to have linked, or maybe you've got the video linked directly. Mm -hmm. And let me just... Um, Get it up here and and watch the introductory video to the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act. So here's this here's this uh, video link. Mm -hmm. There's a guy shooting some seal targets in the woods, and uh, and, th and that that's not the whole video. He goes on to explain in significant detail what the Second Amendment Pre Preservation Act is about and what it does and what the legal basis is for it. And it's quite different than the, than the situation in Kansas. Now, the thing to understand about Kansas is uh, it's, their, their bill was not a bad bill. It just wasn't as complete a solution as ours, and it was attacking the problem from a different angle. And it's based on the fact that the federal government claims to have authority over the states because of the Interstate Commerce Clause to the U.S. Constitution. So in spite of what you might think, Congress and the federal courts and even state courts still recognize that the federal government can't just do anything they want to do. They have to have authority from the states through the U.S. Constitution for the things that they do. The problem that we have is, is that they stretch the meaning of the U.S. Constitution to, you know, beyond, beyond the pale. And one of the things that they've used as an excuse to tell us what we can do in the states, you know, which are which are co-sovereign entities, uh, they're not subdivisions of the federal government. The states created the federal government, not the other way around. Right. But their their excuse is a, a very strained reading of the commerce clause in uh, in the, the Constitution. So, the commerce clause is found in Article One, Section Eight. It's the third clause, and it says. Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. And so what they've taken that to mean is, is not just regulating the exchange of goods across state lines or across the border from the United States to other countries or to the Indian tribes, but they claim that they can regulate our activities within our states. It's a bogus idea. And it all comes back, or it goes back to um, an infamous U.S. Supreme Court ruling that came down in 1942 called Wickard versus Filburn. And, and Filburn was a farmer. And uh, at the time, if you remember, that was at the tail end of the New Deal. 
So you had uh, the you know one of the presidents that expanded the federal government mm -hmm. more than any others, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he had a whole series of acts that were expanding the role of the federal government and and making it more and more intrusive in our lives. Okay. And um, and so this was one of the things that they did was they they had a uh, they placed limits on how much grain a farmer could grow. And, uh, and Farmer Filburn was allowed like 10 or 12 acres of wheat, that's all. 10 or 12 acres of wheat he could grow. And so he grew about twice that much. And half of it I think he intended to sell. The other half he wasn't gonna sell. He was gonna feed it to his own livestock on his own farm. It was not going to cross state lines. It wasn't even gonna leave his farm. But the federal government still claimed that they could tell him what he could or could not grow and then feed to his own livestock. Well, he took it to the Supreme Court and he lost. Largely he lost because there'd been a battle earlier uh, over some other uh, terribly intrusive laws that FDR wanted to pass. And, and the Supreme Court was knocking them down one after another until uh, Roosevelt and his cronies in, the, in Congress, they had a plan, they hatched a plan. They decided that since they had the Supreme Court ruling against them, they would use their power, which was a legitimate authorized power, to increase the number of justices sitting on the Supreme Court. Yeah. And of course, Roosevelt would get to appoint all those justices. So it was a, it was, it's called the court packing plan. Yep. And, um, and so they were gonna, you know, you might be familiar with now we have nine, nine. justices. Yep. Right, they did then, they did before then, but he was going to add another handful of justices, so he would he would tip the tide uh, to people that supported his his very socialist programs, and uh, and so a couple of the Supreme Court judges capitulated and they started voting against their conscience and for these terrible ideas like this, uh, like like the limits on how much grain they could grow, um, and so they called that by the way the switch in time that saved nine. Mm -hmm. So two of those just Supreme Court justices, they switched their ideological perspectives, started voting with the president, and then the president backed off and they kept the nine-person uh, nine, uh, Supreme Court. So what does that have to do with, uh, with Kansas and Missouri? Um, Kansas, you know, some smart people in Kansas recognized that the Interstate Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution was the excuse the federal government had uh, to tell them what to do in, in Kansas. And they decided, well, this is bogus. If it doesn't cross state lines, it really isn't an interstate commerce, and they really don't have any authority to tell us what we can and what we can't do. And so they decided that they were going to pass a law that said if it's made in Kansas, and if it's used in Kansas, and it never leaves Kansas, then the federal government has absolutely no say in what we do. And so we're going to declare any law that uh, would tell us otherwise null and void in Kansas. Now, I think they're right. I think that's exactly right. I think their analysis of the Constitution was right, but they lacked an enforcement mechanism. There was no way for them to enforce it. They, just simply saying something doesn't make it so. And, and so the federal government, I'm convinced, decided to find a person or two to make an example of. And so they found a guy who made a suppressor and a customer who bought that suppressor, and they charged them with uh, violating federal laws against so using suppressors without you know, an appropriate tax stamp. And, and they charged him with, with a felony violation of federal law, uh, okay. you know, building and then possessing a suppressor illegally. Mm -hmm. They were convicted. And, and uh, they didn't do any time, but now they have felony convictions. Not a good deal. Uh, the thing to understand, though, is there was nothing in the, the Kansas law to protect them. The attorney general didn't help them. The, the prosecutors helped them. Nobody from the state of Kansas was obligated to help them. And I suspect maybe even uh, there were probably some officials in Kansas that helped the federal government identify these guys. Um, federal officials are not supposed to go into a state jurisdiction without asking permission or at least notifying the local authorities. And, you know, that kind of cooperation 
probably facilitated uh, these these guys' arrest. But understand, uh, there was nothing in the Kansas law with any teeth. There was nothing in the Kansas law that provided any kind of cover for the citizens of Kansas uh, or any officials that might come to their aid. Okay. And that's what's different between the Kansas law and the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act. Um, the Missouri Second Amendment Preservation Act, if, again, if the, the video explains this very well, but it's based on the fact that the federal government does not have the resources to do any wholesale enforcement of federal gun control laws. It's not made uh, to eliminate every single problem. It's designed to deal with the situation when perhaps they have um, a, uh, a ban of some kind of a weapon or, or device, you know. So let's say if they, if they ban certain scary looking black rifles, you know, what they like to call assault weapons, uh, and they decide that they're gonna go and confiscate them from people, the federal government is gonna need a lot of help from local state authorities. And same thing with bump stocks, or if they're gonna try to enforce a registration or fill in the blank. They need help from local authorities. The Second Amendment Preservation Act makes it illegal for those local authorities to participate in that, to give them any kind of aid or assistance. And not only is it just declared illegal, but there's teeth in it. If, if, that, if there is a, uh, a state official who participates in some kind of federal enforcement against you or I, you or I have a cause of action to sue them as an individual their department and or the state in civil court. So we don't have to wait for a prosecutor, we don't have to wait for the attorney general, we don't have to wait for anybody for us to get some satisfaction in court. Uh, what's more, if a law enforcement officer participates in that, they lose their Missouri law enforcement license you know, after you know, due process. Mm -hmm. And then they can never work in law enforcement ever again. You know, so there's a lot of disincentive for that, for, uh, Missouri officials then to participate. So again, SEPA is designed to deal with the big wholesale uh, outlawing of firearms or accessories. It's not designed to give you cover if you decide that you want to you want to go build yourself, you know, a bazooka or something like that. Uh, this is designed to 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 take advantage of the fact that the federal government doesn't have the resources to do any kind of wholesale uh, gun control, they need local and state authorities to help them. Right, thank you very much for that uh, explanation. Uh, a lot of people will hopefully be satisfied with that because our bill is different than the Kansas bill that became their law. Ours, as, as Ron says, has built-in protections. Um, and thank you once again for actually going into the history of the, the Commerce Clause too. Uh, because that was actually important. Um, I and mean, I'll tell you what, um, in, in regards to that, um, I would say that the Missouri bill is, is actually so incredibly unique. Um, I would say that our bill is probably good enough for consumption in other states, and we know that Oklahoma has an exact copy of our bill, do we not? Oklahoma does, and uh, West Virginia West does, Virginia. And, South and South Carolina. And South Carolina, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's so and they, we're working on some other states. Okay, gotcha. And are you being contacted, or the is uh, Senator Burleson being contacted by you know officials in other states? How does this work exactly? Where other states no, are getting I, the same bill? Uh, you know, I'm not sure how they're coming up with them. Well, I, I take that back. Um, I don't know if you've linked the Tenth Amendment Center. The I have. Tenth Amendment Center. They they are great folks, and uh, really, this anti commandeering concept probably, if you truth be told, originates with them. And, and you know, they are communicating with people in, in a lot, a lot of states about this and other issues relating to state sovereignty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I know that they're passing our language on to other states. Um, there's, there was an indication that there were, uh, oh, I don't know, I've forgotten now, maybe 15 or 20 uh, reps in Michigan that were doing something that, that was... Uh, along these lines but not really quite on par with it and so i i sent all of them an email last week and mm -hmm. i and i got at least one contact back 
So, you know, that's one of the ways we can spread the news. There's some legislators in other states don't aren't aware of the Missouri model for the Second Amendment Preservation Act, and we just need to share it with them. Of course, as as we progress through the process in the Missouri legislature, it will gain a lot of steam and notoriety, and other states will sit up and they'll take notice. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've actually explained in other videos before, we don't need permission from the federal government to do this because the permission lies within the Tenth Amendment. I mean, it's been there all this time. Uh, we're simply taking advantage of the rights that we were given during the construction of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to, you know, actually do this, you know, to push back a little bit on the federal government saying, listen, you're getting just a little bit, you're going a little too far with these gun laws and you're making us a little bit nervous. So we need to assure our citizens that their Second Amendment right that's guaranteed in the Constitution will not be taken away in our state. And that's the way I kind of see it. Well, yeah, I say, I might rephrase it just a little bit. I, the way I look at it is, is uh, the, the Constitution didn't give us any rights. Uh, the Constitution is a, is a limit on government what defines what the, what the federal government's powers are, and, and it is a reservation of rights by the state and the people. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution is a compact between the states. If you look at the ratification clause, uh, it's very, very clear the states created the federal government, not the other way around. Right. And, um, you know, the, we, we are given by God our, the right, right to defend ourselves and our family. Mm -hmm. And the, the Bill of Rights are just uh, assurances that the federal government, or and, and I guess theoretically through the incorporation of the 14th Amendment, incorporation clause, uh, state governments can't trample on those rights. Mm -hmm. you know, they're guarantees, they're not, they're not the bestowal of our rights. Yeah, and that kind of reminds me of something I'm just going to, you know, remind everyone of, um, interpretation of the Constitution. Um, I don't think we need any interpretation of the Second Amendment, but I, I do want to remind everyone what Janet Reno said. She was Attorney General under Bill Clinton. She said the Second Amendment was put in the Constitution for hunters. She actually oh said that. And well, it was. <laughs> she said just for hunters. hunters to defend themselves against tyrants. <laughs> yeah. The tyrannical bears and deer yeah. and rabbits, you know. And, uh, you know, ask King, ask King George's men uh, how they felt about the colonial hunters as they chased them back <laughs> off of Concord and Lexington Green. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, guys, w this is serious, um, and I've said in my last video, this is not a game. Um, what we're doing here is, is very important, and we need all of you on board, all of you. Everyone in the state of Missouri who cares about the Second Amendment, we need you to act, every one of you. Uh, and, by the way, like I said, it doesn't end. You've got a responsibility if you've seen this video. And if you filled out the witness form, then thank you very much. But your responsibility doesn't end there. You need to let your family know. You need to let your friends know. And your coworkers know about this. Because Ron will be the first one here to tell you, we are not getting any help from the press. None. Uh, it's what we're doing here the YouTubers, the Facebookers, what the Senator himself is doing, what the Representative is doing, what Aaron Dorr is doing with the Missouri Firearms Coalition, what Ron Calzone is doing with his organization, MissouriFirst.org. This is how we get the word out about these things. So if you have come across this information, please share it. Please share the videos. Um, Ron, again, um, you know, thank you for everything you're doing. What's our call to action right now? Again, we got these. Oh, go ahead. You, you, you know, uh, you're getting to read me well. You know what I'm thinking. <laughs> something. You, you just said something that just really hit a chord with me. What we're doing would not have been possible before the Internet. Yeah. And it, and it wouldn't have been possible before social media. I mean, this just could not have been done because, like you say, there's a, there's a mainstream media blackout on this. Yes, case. there is. And... And, I, and, you know, it's something else that some of your, your viewers might not be aware of, but we did this in 2013. We actually passed this in 2013. We put it on the governor's desk. He wouldn't sign it. And, and the governor vetoed it. But then we, took, we went back through, and the House overrode the veto. And then the Senate almost overrode the veto. There were two Republican senators who changed sides, and we missed overriding the veto by one vote. Mm-hmm. 
And then we came back in 2014 and we got within just one vote of passing it again. And that's a little bit longer story. But we, in Missouri, we've done this before. Now, the governor that vetoed it is gone. The governor that we have now in Missouri voted for SEPA multiple times, including the veto override vote. Mm -hmm. So he voted against the governor. Uh, the attorney general that we have now voted for SEPA multiple times. And the two senators that were traitors and trade changed their votes, they're gone. In fact, that's the main reason that we waited until 2019 to bring this back again. We mm -hmm. had to wait till they were termed out and they were gone because they were in leadership and they were going to continue to be an obstacle. Mm -hmm. You know, so we this is not our first rodeo. You know, we've been down this before. So so folks, if you decide that you're going to help, understand that you're not working with rank amateurs. We know how to do this. We've done it before. Mm -hmm. So call to action. I'm sorry. Yep. I got. I, yeah, no. I, uh, you need. You, you know, it's too bad you can't kick through Skype because <laughs> you could, you could kick me or elbow me and get me off my soapbox a little bit. So, so going back to, uh, to my desktop. You know, one of the places, one of the links that Patrick will have, will take you to this resource page, and, you know, right here, this big ugly sign right here. You can see what the date for the hearing is. And um, and if you go down, or I'm sorry, go up a little bit, right here, there's a link that will take you to the witness form. And here's the date for the hearing schedule again. Mm -hmm. Our date, yeah, date for the date and, and directions to, to uh, the hearing. And that's for the Senate version. And all that is very imminent. That's this week. So if you only do one thing right now, fill out the witness form. Mm -hmm. Uh, then if we scroll down a little bit, we can see the call to action for House Bill 1637. And right now, that's just very simple. And that is, is call your rep and ask them to co-sponsor it and don't take no for an answer. And then get your neighbors and your friends and your family to do the same thing. They've got to call their rep and they've got to say, we want you to co-sponsor it. Now, maybe I should point out, you can click on this link right here and you'll see a link of people that have already co-sponsored it. Mm -hmm. Make this a little bit larger. You know, so these are the these are the existing co-sponsors. You might check that first to make sure that your rep's not already on there. And you know, but um, if their name's not on there, then that means you need to call and make sure that they get their name on it. They can do it remotely. They can do it from home. They can do it from their office. They just log in and go online, and they say, "I want to sponsor." Uh, this bill. Mm -hmm. so you, you need to be ready to tell them that it's House Bill 1637. Mm -hmm. Yep, House Bill 1637. That's the House side of the Second Amendment Preservation Act. The Senate side, of course, is Senate Bill or SB 588. So this is it, gang. Um, we're uh, looking to get this out of uh, committee and onto the floor, hopefully on the 6th of February, this Thursday, three days from now, uh, at the time of this recording, um, I think we're about uh, 8.30 at night or so, nearly 9 o'clock at night on Monday night, but I will get hopefully get this up and uploaded on YouTube tonight. Uh, please remember, um, this is important, gang. Uh, we appreciate if you're making phone calls. We appreciate if you're filling out a witness form. We even deeply appreciate if you can make it up to the Capitol on Thursday. But what we appreciate more is sharing the information. Believe me, your neighbor probably doesn't even know this is happening. They have no idea these bills even exist. The mainstream media has, as Ron has said, is, is in blackout mode for the state of Missouri, for the Second Amendment Preservation Act. And indeed, for, there are some other good bills like the, um, the gun-free zone um, repudiation bill or whatever is it, the, the nickname for it. Basically... Uh, you know, taking away gun-free zones in the state of Missouri where the state has jurisdiction, not in federal areas like army bases or anything. But there's other good bills. But SEPA is, is certainly, in my opinion, is the most important of all the bills that we have right now. We're, we're one presidential election away from some pretty onerous federal gun control laws. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who knows when, who knows who will win? come November and you know now is the time to put the safeguard in place mm -hmm. 
And not only that, you're doing it for yourselves, you're doing it for your kids, you're doing it for your grandkids. But think about this, gang. You're actually helping other states by doing this for them to actually get something done as well. So what we're doing here in Missouri is going to help Oklahoma. And when, when Oklahoma gets this done, hopefully, you know, this year or even next year, then they will be helping Arkansas get it done, you know, and, you know, Kansas get it done. Kansas needs some stronger, you know, bills in place as well. But so this is really, really important. You know, we talk about this all the time on the channel is we're afraid of tyrannical action from the federal government. We're always afraid of it. And what happens when we're afraid of the federal government, gang? We have a tyranny. That's what we have. When the federal government is afraid of the people, then we have freedom. It's that simple. One more thing I want to point out before I wrap this up. <clears throat> I don't know if you're aware of this, Ron, but I think it was Thursday or Friday of last week. The state of Tennessee had their gun rally day. Um, and that, of course, was in their capital, Capital Rotunda. And once again, this was open and concealed carry. Everyone went into the Capitol building, took pictures of themselves holding their guns, um, and not a shot fired. No one got killed, you know, from these crazy people, you know, with these AR-15 strapped on their backs. You know, their concealed carry, you know, 9 millimeters, 40 caliber, 45. No one got killed. In fact, not, not a single shot went off. It's incredible. I I would venture to say that it was probably the safest place in the state. <laughs> I would say so, too. Three hours there. <laughs> uh, because it, we get a bad rap in the media. Um, in fact, I want to say one more thing, and I know I keep drawing this thing out, but I remember, Ron, I was a big supporter of Missouri Constitutional Concealed Carry, Eric Burleson. You know, thank you, Eric Burleson, for bringing that and, and taking care of it and taking it all the way to the finish line for us. There was a lot of us that called in our support on that one. But I do remember that one did get covered by the mainstream media. We actually had coverage, and we had analysts saying that it was highly likely that neighbors would be shooting each other over minor arguments with their concealed oh, care. Yep, yeah, that yeah. we were going to turn into the Wild West out here in Missouri if that went through. You know, that, uh, you know, people would be shooting uh, clerks at uh, f fast food restaurants if their food didn't get there fast enough. Uh, you know, the silliness that they... they... Well, you know, that, that was the same sort of thing we faced 16, 18 years ago when, when uh, concealed carry, permitted concealed carry was being passed. Yep. There would be blood in the streets, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and it had been wrong. And instead, crime has steadily decreased. Yep. And I think uh, since uh, Missouri uh, constitutional concealed carry went through... I do believe the statistics have shown in the last three years, violent crime is down some 70%. Mm -hmm. 70%. Guys, it doesn't mean Missouri's perfect. We still have burglaries. We still have, you know, you know, all kinds of, you know, stuff, shoplifting and things of that nature. But violent crime is down 70%. That's a, an amazing st statistic. I don't think anyone could balk at those numbers missouri is simply a safer place to live than many other states because of concealed carry and it's, if you took if you took the gang violence out of the st louis area it would be even better than that yeah absolutely and we do have that problem in in st louis and um you know it's not something we're proud of but it is gang related every state seems to have it but uh, st louis seems to be closely connected to chicago in many ways and and you guys all know what Chicago's like. That is the war zone, where they have the tightest gun control in the entire United States, with the exception of District of Columbia, is Chicago proper, Cook County. And we all know the grisly statistics coming out of Chicago. Some 800 to 900 gun deaths per year in Chicago alone, just in one city. And that's where they have the tightest gun controls. There's conceal, getting a concealed carry in Chicago is virtually impossible for the average person there. It's very difficult to do. Owning guns is, is, is really expensive. You have to pay a yearly tax in Cook County for your, for your weapons. Wow, I didn't know that. Yep, a yearly tax. So, of course, they're registered when you get them, and they send you a tax bill for your guns every single year. Um, so they never should have... I wonder what would happen if you didn't pay it. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, I think I have an idea. Yeah, I think I have an idea too, especially since they knew when you said, you know, when they sent you the bill. 
Exactly. That's when the people come out and say, I'm sorry, boating accident, you know. But Well, no, I'm, I imagine that they've got a law saying, this. they've tried to pass this in Missouri, if you lose or if your firearm is stolen, you would have an obligation to report it. And right. if you don't, you're committing a crime. Right. You know, so if you didn't report that boating accident, then then you've committed a crime. So they've got it figured out, mm. you know. You, you, you understand that registration is confiscation. Mm -hmm. It's just pre-confiscation. Right. So absolutely. And yep. that's one of the things that, that the Second Amendment Preservation Act, you know, one of the things that we haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about is getting people to read the bill. Mm -hmm. It's a history lesson. Yes. It's a fun read. Yep. Uh, not, only, not only that, but also, too, um, I, guys, I hate to bring this up again, especially as Braun was making a good point, but I want to remind everyone how Hitler did it. And I'm a student of history myself. Hitler started with gun registration, then went to red flag laws, then went to outright confiscation. This is the same model that unfortunately we're starting to see on the federal level. Registration's already done. When you purchase your firearm, you lawfully, I hate to use that word, purchase your firearm, you have to register it with the gun store. So that's, that's if you're not buying it you know, from a private individual. But the red flag laws are something we, guys, we have really got to be aware of every law that comes through from now on because it could take not just one, but maybe a little bit of a of a red flag law is in this bill, a little bit's in this bill, a little bit's in this bill. And if they all three get passed, boom, they come together and make a red flag law. I mean, they're sneaky. I mean, we, oh, I'm sorry, Ron, I took up a lot of time. You finish up your point. No, uh, that's, you, you made it. That's great. Okay. So, uh, but that's what we're trying to do in Missouri. We're trying to make red flag laws, you know, basically something that would be so incredibly difficult to pass here. Um, the Fifth Amendment can well, go ahead. Well, and understand that 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 you know there's there are state red flag laws, mm -hmm. and then there's a chance that we federal. might you know, President Trump has endorsed a federal red flag bill. You yep. know, he said at one point he may have backtracked. I don't know, but the Second Amendment Preservation Act will protect Missourians from federal red flag bills. That's right. And by the way, uh, President Trump is in campaign mode. He is very friendly to the Second Amendment for at least the next uh, nine months now. Uh, well, that's right. And, uh, and you know, um, we might step on some Trump supporters' toes a little bit, but, um, you know, when he was in the middle of his first session, or his first term, uh, you know, that's when we started hearing talk about bump mm -hmm. stock bans and red flag laws. Yeah. And so if he wins next November... And confiscation before due process. That's right. Don't forget you know, that. Yeah, that's and a I, very big one right there, gang. Uh, go yeah. ahead, Ron. So, I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that it could be come November, he might win, and he will have a mandate to do anything he wants to do. And, you know, it may be good or it may be bad. I don't know. I, I, I tend not to trust people with power because power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap it up here, but I'm going to go uh, and uh, repeat our call to action, if you don't mind, Ron. Um, if you guys can make it on Thursday, please do make it to the Capitol. Ron's page will have everything you need to know. If it's canceled, Ron, and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's canceled, uh, let's just say Thursday morning at 1 o'clock in the morning because of weather, that would definitely show up on your page, right? Well, yes. If they, if they What they'll do is they'll assess it Wednesday afternoon. Okay. And, and that's when they'll make a decision whether or not to cancel it. I think... It'll be pretty hard for this to cancel this time because okay. uh, it was already canceled once. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be very, very frank. This is virtually the same committee that heard this bill last year mm -hmm. and overwhelmingly passed it out. Okay. So uh, there's one, there's been one change. There was one Democrat on, senator on this committee who was appointed to, another, to a bureaucratic office by the governor. Mm -hmm. And that Democrat was a no vote. So we're actually in a stronger position than we were last year. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that really our goal is to get the hearing out of the way, get them to have a, an executive session on it. And that's when the senators will vote. Do we want to send it out of the committee or not? And the sooner that we can have those things happen, the sooner it gets to the floor and the greater the likelihood will, will be that we get it through the Senate. Um, and, and our goal is to get it through the Senate in the form we want it to be, 
and then get the House to take it up and pass it just like it left the Senate, and then it's a done deal. It goes to the governor. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's it, gang. Mm -hmm. I'm at the, the witness forms, witness forms, witness forms. And if you filled them out, thank you so much for doing so. But please get your friends, your neighbors, and your family all on board on this. Get them to do witness forms as well. We need phone calls and emails to our representatives who are currently not co-sponsors to HB 1637. That's what we need, gang. That's our call to action. We're making progress, though, and that's a good thing. We're making progress on everything. But once again, this thing is nothing if we don't have grassroots support. That's what your representatives will do what you want. You just have to let them know. You know, that's literally what it comes down to. That's, you know, what the whole state government, the whole state legislature is kind of built on. This is a better form of government than what we have in D.C., where they really, truly don't care what you think. These guys do, but they need to know what you think. So you have to contact them either by email or by phone. And, of course, the, the sponsor, or I'm sorry, the uh, witness forms. So, uh, Ron, and, today, and you know, it's been it's Patrick. It's been working. This this is a lot of co-sponsors already. We yeah. want more, but this is a lot. I don't know for sure, but I would venture to say that this bill has more co-sponsors than any other bill in the House right now. OK. And, and yeah. we want to double it. We still want to double that yep. because it will be overwhelming. It will be like a steamroller mm -hmm. going to the House. Yep. And, and like Ron said, uh, you know, we'd like to see a thousand. Uh, witness forms. I would like to see 5,000 witness forms. You know, <laughs> that's what I'd like to see. I mean, overwhelm them. Show them how much you want this. It's all up to you. It really is. Now, Patrick, I, I've got to print them all, so let, let's not get carried away. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't mind printing out 5,000 of these, right? Uh, I don't think. No, I wouldn't mind. We might, have to, we might have to go to Staples and get some more paper. but Yeah, understood. Um, so, uh, but I want to say at the end of this, because I, I don't say it often enough, Thank you, everyone who is helping with this. All of you, thank you so much. We are literally, we're the, we're the beacon on the hill right now. Um, this is far in advance to what any state has, and we, might, we have a really good shot of getting this done. And if we do, we can show others the way. So it's not just for us. It's not just for your kids and grandkids. It's for your neighboring states, states all over the United States to actually get a little bit of their freedom back. So this is important, and we thank you all for participating in this. Everyone who's doing something, for the phone calls, the emails, the witness forms. And eventually, we'll be having you guys make phone calls to the governor, too. Um, but that's a, what a grassroots effort is. This is literally how these things get done. You can't show up for one rally and expect it to get done. Legislate, le the hard legislation. The hard legislation has to be pushed and prodded and pulled all the way through the process mm -hmm. until it's done. Absolutely. And the bills that matter, yeah, you're going to burn up some shoe leather, but it's for a good cause. It, it is for freedom. It's for liberty. So let's make that, you know, let's make the effort here. Guys, this is the year to get this bill passed. I promise you, this is the year. It, like, you know, Ron said, we kind of have a wonderful alignment of stars here. You know for this to actually happen but the grassroots support is 50 percent of the entire effort stuff goes on on the inside we don't worry about that you know we worry about the grassroots side that's when we make phone calls we voice our support and people like ron make it easy for us with those witness forms uh aaron door with the missouri fire alarms coalition also has a way to get stuff done i'll list his stuff uh too but i'm going to put ron's at the very top because ron's is kind of critical for the witness forms gang so make sure to watch ron's video if you've not seen it yet on sepa the link right down below in the description section but please do the witness forms and get your family to do the witness forms you know talk to your friends at work and let's get this done. The witness forms are critical at this point in time. Absolutely. Okay. Ron, I, I can't thank you again. And I burned up a lot of your time tonight. So um, double thanks. That's okay. I had supper. I'm, I'm sitting pretty here. So we're okay. doing good. And okay. I'll tell you what, this is, uh, your help has just been tremendous on this. This is uh, exactly what we needed. Uh, in 2013 and 2014, we got it across the finish line. 
but we really didn't have any social media experts that were helping with it. And it, it was uh, it was kind of a seat of the pants. And uh, you had the, a more organized social media attack is going to be a big help. Now, I'll tell you what, I owe it all to my granddaughter. I'm somewhat of a social media lackey. She showed me a lot of stuff I didn't know. Um, but no, as far as that goes, I am so happy to help. This is near and dear to my heart. This is important to me. And as I always say, I'd like to leave this place in better condition than I came into it for my kids. So, I'm at the, guys, let's, let's vote for liberty. When you vote for the Second Amendment Preservation Act, you're voting for liberty. You're voting for freedom. And you're also uh, putting the federal government on notice. Hey, you guys get a little bit too far out of line. You know, we're going to go ahead and pull out the Tenth Amendment on you. And we're going to use it to make sure that you can't do this to us anymore. So, you know, there's a, one more alternative, and it's what Thomas Jefferson said to do, that from time to time the tree of liberty must be refreshed with the blood of tyrants and patriots. Let's not let it get to that level, gang. We have just all kinds of means at our disposal to push back when the federal government gets a little too tyrannical. Um, red flag laws are not a joke. They are not a joke, and they're, per, they're constantly knocking on the door. They're pervasive. They keep showing up. And then when they put bits of it in different bills that get passed separately, and then they get assembled together, and you got a red flag law, it's very difficult to get rid of it. So at the very least, you need to be looking into making sure your state's not doing any red flag laws on you. So with that, once again, Ron, thank you very much. And do you have anything you'd like to say before I wrap her up? Nope, just thank you, and, uh, and God bless. God bless you, too. And thank you all for listening to Truth, Money, and Freedom podcast. We appreciate each and every one of you. Please share this video. May God bless each and every one of you. Have a good evening. Okay, that's a wrap. All right, good. My camera battery went out. <laughs> <laughs>